Hello everyone, uh, my name is Chi Young Seo. I'm the software engineer and architect at Couchbase caching and storage team. In this session, I'm going to talk about two novel memory features that we newly introduced in Couchbase Server 3.0. So in this session, first of all, I'm going to talk about the data manager in the Couchbase Server. It's a main architecture. It's a data manager, data bucket, database bucket architecture, and also the data manager's NLU-based cache management. And so I'm going to explain the value-only ejection mode that has been used since Couchbase server, uh, since the early phase of a Couchbase, server, a Couchbase server. Then second part of this presentation, I'm going to talk about the new cache management that we, that we newly introduced in Couchbase server 3.0. Especially, uh, mainly I'm going to talk about the full metadata ejection mode that, uh, which, which, which was proposed to address the limitation of the uh, value-only ejection mode uh, previous, uh, before Couchbase Server 3.0. And then I'm going to explain the performance impact from full metadata ejections, and then uh, our future, future plan to address those performance impact. So let me uh, move over to database bucket architecture. This diagram shows the uh, uh, high-level architecture of the Couchbase cluster, which consists of five node clusters. So each cluster has a Couchbase server running on it, and each Couchbase server consists of two main processes. So first one is a, a cluster manager. Uh, the second one is a data manager. The cluster manager is, uh, is take care of, is, uh, cluster manager take, take, takes care of the monitoring each node in the cluster such as the resource, uh, the CPU and memory and disk usages, and also detecting the node failure, and also performing the node uh, failure operations. And also cluster manager was take uh, responsible for the uh, cl uh, doing, uh, performing cluster rebalance when the new node joined the, uh, joined the cluster, so that the data, entire data space can be, can be redistributed among the node in the cluster. And then second big part is a data manager. Second, the other process is data manager process. The data manager is mainly, mainly responsible for processing the read-write request, data read-write read request from the client applications. So the, in this session, I'm going to focus on the data manager side, and it's a main architecture, and it's a, a cache policy, and an ejection policy as well. So, Let's move over to data manager architecture. So data manager architecture, in the front, front end side, we have a MacHD layer. So probably most of you guys, most of you are familiar with the MacHD. MacHD is uh, one of the widely used caching solution uh, in the, in the, uh, in the, soft, uh, in the uh, database world. And the MacHD basically uh, manages the uh, client connections and also uh, responsible for communicating the request, I mean, communicating data with the, uh, with the uh, client, client side as well. So it's based on the Rev event based. It's based on Rev event library, which is an asynchronous uh, event notification mechanism. And inside MemQHD, there is a bucket engine, which, which uh, take care of, which support multi-tenancies. What does that mean? Multi-tenancy means bucket engine allows an application, allows application to instantiate multiple database instances. So you have an application. You have a, a global scale web application. You may want to create multiple database buckets inside a Couchbase cluster. So in the bottom layer, we have shared thread pool. Shared thread, thread pool it basically has a, a three different groups of the uh, thread. The, it has a, it is a responsible for uh, the performing read-write request from the disk, and also so managing the cache, in-memory cache as well. So in the shared thread, shared thread pool, we have uh, three different kinds of uh, uh, thread group. First is the reader groups, IO, IO reader groups, IO writer groups, and then the third one is a cache management uh, thread. And then there is a uh, storage engine layers which is now is a still couch store. Uh, couch store is a append only based P plus tree. 
So uh, in this session, I'm not going to talk about this storage engine layer. I mainly talk about this, uh, the database bucket architecture and its cache management. So this is a database bucket architecture. So database bucket architecture support memcached compatible binary protocols, such as get, set, delete, add, which, in, which, which are known as a CRUD operations. And inside database bucket, we, have, we maintain separate in-memory hash table for each partition, which has, which has active or a replica state. So when you instantiate, when you instantiate the database bucket in the Couchbase cl cluster, we have 1,024 active partitions, and we have, and also there, there are multiples of 1,024 replica partitions, depending on your replication factor. So in each node, we maintain separate hash table, in-memory hash table, uh, which is used as a built-in cache. And then for each uh, hash table, in-memory hash table, we, have, we maintain checkpoint, uh, uh, checkpoint, uh, checkpoint data structure, which is a unified queue for replication and persistence. So as you can, as you can see here, there is a flusher daemon task. Basically, it flushers uh, uh, visit each partition hash table uh, checkpoint uh, queue and then grab all dirty items from the queue. It's visit one queue, uh, checkpoint queue at a time, and then grab all dirty items from the checkpoint queue, and then write them into the append on plus uh, storage engine, which is a couch store as, 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 this, as of this time. And then there is a, a writer thread group, uh, which take care of running this flush or daemon task. And then also there is a, a batch reader uh, daemon task, which, uh, which take care of reading document values for, for non-resident items in cache. So in cache, there, there are some items whose value is not resident. So when we receive the get operation from client application, we have to spawn, we have to push background, uh, ba background fetch request to this BG fetch reader, so that BG fetch readers can be run by this reader thread group inside shared thread pool. And also, there is a, on the, left, on the right, right hand side, there is a, also the daemon task, which are related to uh, the cache management. Here we have item pager, and the expiry pager, and the checkpoint manager. So item pager take care, takes care of evicting, ejecting some non-dirty items from this in-memory hash table. So it's a daemon task. It's a run, uh, I'm gonna explain a little bit more detail and then eject some of the uh, non-dirty items from each hash table, uh, in-memory hash table. And expiry pager, here's expiry pager, right? So expiry pager is, uh, expiry pager is responsible for uh, collecting all expire, expired items from in-memory hash table, and then uh, push them into checkpoint queue, corresponding checkpoint queue for replication and persistence. So those uh, cache, manage, cache daemon tasks Cache management demo tasks, demo, demo tasks are scheduled by non ir thread group inside uh, shared thread pool. So in the le left-hand side, we have a data replicator, which replicate the, all the mutations to the corresponding uh, the replica partitions in the remote node. So this data replicator, data replicator is now uh, supported by DCP uh, uh, which is a new streaming protocol uh, for, uh, that in Couchbase Server 3.0. So then let me move over to uh, the, uh, let me get more details on the hash, uh, partition hash table. So this is in-memory hash table, which consists of multiple hash buckets. So each hash bucket is maintained by, have, by the linked list of the items to, uh, to address hash collisions. And also, we have uh, multiple logs to synchronize, synchronize access to those hash table buckets. So let me show some uh, a diagram. So this is a very high level uh, the structure of the in-memory hash table. So as you can see, we have 
n number of hash buckets. And then we have m number of the logs. So each log is responsible for synchronizing the access to the access to the same number of hash table buckets. But there is an interesting uh, point here. So as you insert more and more new items, the size of each hash table bucket will grow because of hash, increased uh, hash collision, right? So to address this problem, because that will affect the performance, because we have to scan in this uh, scanning uh, corresponding hash table uh, bucket. To address this problem, we have a daemon task. We have another daemon task, which, is, which, which we call hash table resizer, which visit each in-memory hash table regularly, and then uh, resizing the hash table, uh, resizing in-memory hash table by considering the number of items in the hash table, the number of, number of buckets in the hash table. So this is uh, basically uh, scheduled by uh, non IO thread group uh, inside the global thread pool. So now let's move over to NLU-based cache management. So NLU stands for not recently used, which is a simplified version of LLU. LLU is a least recently used, which is a, one of the widely used cache, uh, the cache management uh, mechanism. So we extend, we extend the typical NLU uh, approaches by having, by maintaining two bits of NLU, and two bits of NLU values per item in hash table. So we maintain two bits of NL, uh, two NLU bits per item in hash table, which means that NLU value for each item in hash table can have a score from zero to three. So lower NLU value, lower, lower NLU value, the item which has a lower NLU value means it, it is now frequently accessed by application. The item with a higher NLU value is an item that is that which, which is less frequently accessed by uh, application. So for when you insert a brand new item, when we insert a brand new item into the hash table, its NLU score is set to two by default, which is a middle value. And then, which is this one, so initial value for new item. And then, that if that item is accessed by read operation, then we decrement NLU value until we hit the uh, NLU value zero. So when you stay at zero, and you, when that item is accessed again, we, then we don't decrement anymore. It's just stay in, at zero. Then the question is, OK, go ahead. So is this maintained uh, on the live mode? Or what about the replica? We also maintain the replica as well. So if you update, if there's an NLU, can you leave that? That's a, uh, that's a great question. So basically, at this time, for if there's NLU value changes in the active partition, we don't part, uh, propagate those NLU value changes to the uh, uh, replica partition. But if that item is uh, mutated, updated, then we, at that time, we ship the NLU value. So, but the, the problem is that if majority, I mean, a lot of items are just accessed by read operation only, then the NLU values from, uh, between active and replica m most likely won't be synchronized. Yeah, go ahead. If you do a set or an update, does it reset it to two, or does it increment it? It's set, just set operation. We don't decrement. We just make, uh, keep current NLU value as it is. Set is basically, we don't consider it as a uh, free country access title, only uh, yeah, read operation. So if I insert a document and then I update that document 100 times? Then it re remains as two. It stays at two. Yes, okay. yeah. So, and then the question is, when, we when this NLU value is incremented? So there is an item pager that I'm going to explain next slide. The item pager is demon task, right? So item pager visit each hash table item and they increment NLU value by one. So th this is a racing between the read, opera read operation from clients and then uh, item pagers. They are just trying to decrement, increment, and like that. So if given given set of items are heavily accessed by the application, then they will, uh, we observe that their NLU score most likely remains uh, between zero and one. So let me explain more detail about this. 
So the item pager is a daemon task that is that, that, that take care, take, takes care of ejecting non dot items from uh, hash, in memory hash table. And it is, it is, it is scheduled if the database broken memory usage is, is a, a greater than high order mark, which is 85% of your bucket memory quarter. And then you eject items until the bucket memory usage is dropped below low order mark. So when you instantiate the database bucket, you have to specify, you, we, should, we should specify memory quarter for the bucket. And then it's a high order mark and low order mark will be set to 85 and 75 respectively by default. But you can change those high order mark and low order mark at runtime as well. Lower or higher, higher values. So this is a bucket memory configuration. So whenever memory usage goes above high order mark, item pager kicks in and then eject items by considering items analysis score uh, and then eject those items, eject some of the items until memory usage is dropped below low order mark. So this is a basically uh, item pager consists of two phases. The phase one, item pager scan the next each hash in memory hash table and then collect the list of items whose analysis score is a three. And then eject those items with an error score three. And then if, then you check the memory condition again. If memory usage is still above low order mark, then it goes to step one again. Visit next in memory hash table. Now item pager finished phase one. But unfortunately, the memory usage is still above low order mark. Then, now it goes into phase two. Which, which is now scan, scan each in-memory hash table again, and then increment each item's NRS score by one. And then if item's NRS score is now equal to three, then we eject that item by, consider, by, by considering the random number and probability. So random number is, oh sorry, random number is, is the N is the random number, which is generated uh, with a range from zero to one. We, we just generate a random number between zero and one. Then probability is uh, calculate, cal calcul estimated by considering current memory usages and low order mark and then partition state, active or replica. So what does that mean is we want to eject more replica items than active items. So probability, this probability will be higher on the replica in memory hash table. And then a, the current ratio is a 6, to, 60 plus, uh, six to four. So we eject six, uh, six replica items. Our, uh, I mean, we ratio is a six to four of the ejection for acti uh, the replica and active uh, in memory hash tables. And then we go to step one again, if memory usage is still above the order. So this is a, consists of two phases, and the reason we chose NLU scheme over other uh, like a cache management is this is uh, extremely uh, memory efficient. It doesn't require any extra memory overhead in our hash table. But if you want to implement, I'm, I mean, impl if you want to implement other caching mechanisms such as NLU, you may have to maintain global data structure to maintain NLU uh, list which is uh, not small memory overhead in the, uh, the large scale deployment. So, but we are, still, we are still improving this area to look at other ma cache management. So we can provide multiple cache management. One of the options is NLU, NLU and the other one is uh, other uh, widely known cache management as well. So now let me move over to access log generator. Access log generator is a daemon, another daemon task, which is scheduled once every day. It's by default, it's 10 a.m. usage by default, but this schedule time can, uh, is configurable at runtime. So you can change the, uh, the configuration time. So it basically scan every in-memory hash table to collect the list of all resident items, and then write their 
metadata into the access log file. And then this access log file is used by warm up task to restore the working set that, have, that, that, were, reg, that, were, that were resident in memory before system crash or before <laughs> node is restarted. So if, if, if whenever there is any node crash or node is restarted, then the warm up task here, system warm up task, can use this access log file to restore your previous working set so that you can start with warm cache uh, again when you, when you have a, uh, uh, the system crash. Yes, exactly. So the question is, before uh, access log is generated, if the system is a crash, then definitely we don't have any access log. So in this case, we just re uh, load the random items from disk. If you, wanna, if you still want to load some item into cache as part of a warm up. Or you can just start with a, a cold cache as well. Yeah, go ahead. Can I trigger that on demand? Hmm? Can I trigger that on demand? Oh, this is an access log generator? Yes, you can, you can disable or enable uh, the access log generator. So if I, if I warm my cache because mm -hmm. I know what I want to be in memory, can I trigger that to be written and recorded after I'm done with my warm-up instead of waiting for 10 a.m.? Oh, you mean, so you, wanna manu you, want, on to, you want to manually run this uh, process, right? The task, right? So. I think, yeah, I think it's doable. We have, uh, I don't remember the exact parameter, but it's a, uh, you can run manually. My understanding, you can still run manually for this task. And then, uh, because you want to just have current working set as, 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 as soon as possible, right? So you can still change the time so that you can, you, you can run immediately. Yeah. Right, so let, let me double check. Let me double check and I'll <laughs> get back to it, yeah. So, and then let's move over to value-only ejection and cache management. So, the value-only ejection mode, this diagram, first of all, this diagram uh, shows the, uh, the hash table, uh, the memory structure of the hash table item. So, as you can see there, we have a key and metadata and uh, pointer to the blob, I mean, actual blob value and then internally as a blob pointer, and then also pointer to the next item in the hash bucket, right? So in the metadata, we have a lot of uh, field. So for example, uh, expression time, and then cache identifier, sequence number, and the region number, and so forth. And there is, we also have uh, NLU values. So this metadata now has a 40 bytes memory over at least, depending on memory allocator. And then uh, also there are extra blob pointer and then pointer to the next item over it, which is uh, in 64 bytes to 16 bytes at least. So, okay, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure, I missed the first part. So did you talk about the sequence number uh, on the DCP? No, I'm not going to talk about the sequence number in DCP. There is a next section. He's going to, our other engineers, will cover this, how sequence number is uh, synchronized among active and replica. So please attend that session. So then let me explain the value only ejection mode. So in this value, ejection, value only ejection mode, the requirement is that application entire, application's entire key space should be maintained in in-memory hash table. So this is a very highly, it's a, it's a, this is a highly cache-oriented architecture, which means that we maintain, we have, to, we have to maintain each item's metadata at least in in-memory in hash table. So in this, in, this, uh, in this ejection mode, item pager eject only item's value from hash table. So what does that mean is that when items get ejected from cache, we still maintain key metadata in memory. So this, which means that when you receive the uh, get operation, let's say key foo, then this key is not resident, value is not resident. So in this case, 
we spawn, we push the background fetch request into the BGFetch batch reader, and then read the corresponding document value from, uh, from, the, from the disk, and then populate that value into the hash table. So then in this case, what is the advantage of the having maintaining uh, metadata in memory? So, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry about that. So in this case, now you, let's assume that your application issue get operation for the key that might not exist in the database, right? So you issue the get, but we, we, for the key that might not exist in the database, right? So in this case, the key existence check is, key existence check can be performed immediately, can be performed instantly by looking up the cache, right? Because we maintain key, all the keys and their metadata in memory. So key existence check can be performed instant, I mean, very quickly, like in memory speed, right? It doesn't require any disk lookup. And also another benefit is that let's, memcached support add operation. Add operation means add operation will fail if key exists in the database. So by maintaining all the keys and the metadata memory, you can, we, can instant, I mean, we can immediately figure out if a key exists or, in, or not, right? So add operation can be processed in a, in a very, uh, very immediately, immediately without having any disk lookup over it. So obviously, there's a pros and cons of this uh, value ejection mode. The pros, is, one of the pros is we, this basically maximizes memory realization if you have enough, in, enough memory capacity. And then it, provide, it does provide predictable high performance in terms of the latency and throughput for uh, basic crowd operations and also the key existence check as well. However, there is a cons. Obviously, it's a very, uh, high memory overhead because, of, because, because we have to maintain all the keys and metadata in memory. And then also another uh, downside is that slow system warm-up time. Because value ejection mode requires all the keys and metadata in memory before we receive the traffic from application. So during warm-up time, we have to load the entire keys and metadata, metadata into the memory. So it has to traverse all, uh, like an entire B tree, B plus tree and then fetch all the keys and metadata as part of warm-up. So warm-up time is uh, getting longer. Yeah, I mean, we, first of all, we have to, I'm gonna explain the warm-up uh, steps in more detail in the later slides, but warm-up, first of all, we have to load keys and all, all the keys and metadata first, and then access, uh, read the access log file to fetch the value for the resident items that, uh, items that were resident before system crash. <coughs> Yeah, in the, from the cache, yeah. So to add, now let's move over to Couchbase Server 3.0, our full metadata ejection. So, full, we, so we, we, we identified these, those limitations from value on ejection mode. To address those limitations, in, as, as of Couchbase Server 3.0, we provided full metadata ejection. We support full metadata ejection. So, with the full metadata ejection, application's entire key space doesn't need to be loaded into cache, which means that we just wanna, uh, there's, there's no memory overhead for non-resident items. We just wanna have the uh, key and metadata value for resident items in memory. So, which means that it can reduce the memory footprint, footprint significantly in the heavy DGM case. DGM is a DGM stand for disk greater than uh, memory. This means that your application, entire application data on disk is a much greater than the physical RAM available in your cluster. Obviously, it's a most of user, your use cases, right? So then, in this case, is item pager eject items key and metadata along with this value. So it's very simple, right? It's basically eject everything. It doesn't have any, it doesn't incur any memory overhead. 
And then now we receive the uh, get operation for key foo. Now we spawn background fetches. In this case, we have to read metadata and value together. Then we populate uh, hash table entry again. So, but in this case, the, the downside of this full metadata ejection is it requires more disk lookup. Let's say you application issue a lot of key existence check. I want to check if that key is exist or not. Then we first of all look up the hash table. It doesn't, it, do, it doesn't exist in the hash table. That doesn't mean the item doesn't exist, right? So we have to look up disk. And then similarly, add operation, delete operation require more disk lookup. Because if item doesn't exist in the hash, uh, hash table, then that doesn't mean that item doesn't exist in, doesn't exist in the disk, right? So, so which means that we require more disk IO lookup overhead. So many of read-write APIs require item metadata to be resident in the cache. So those APIs are affected by full ejection mode. For example, uh, we have, uh, uh, in this case, we have a cache operation, compare and set, add, delete, and touch. Let me give some example. So cache operation, compare and set API, which is uh, uh, one of the MMKHD uh, APIs. So cache operation, when server receives the cache operation from client, then server has to compare cache identifier from client with the uh, cache identifier in server. So if they are still equal, then cache operation will finally succeed. So as I mentioned before, cache is uh, one of the metadata, uh, metadata. Cache identifier is one of the metadata field. So when you receive a cache operation, is, here is a key foo, and the cache value is uh, 100, and the value is uh, that's a two. And then there's no key. There is a no key with foo in hash table. So in this case, we spawn the background fetches for, to read uh, metadata from disk. Then as you can see, we have a metadata, a key foo and metadata here. So we, we read we read metadata from the cache. Then here we, we, we see that uh, cache identifier is still 100. So then finally cache operation is succeed. Because two cache values are still same. So values now is a value for key foo now is, can be updated update to value two. So in this case, now while BG fetcher, while, while batch reader Read, uh, read, the value, read the metadata from disk, the connection to the client is uh, completely blocked. So because the connection to the, to the client is blocked while we are the BG fetcher, while BG fetcher, BG batch reader uh, reads the, uh, the metadata from disk, which means that it could affect the latency, it could affect the uh, throughput as well. So similar to add the API and delete API, they are also, uh, as I mentioned before, more disk lookup is, uh, are required. And then let me move over to the uh, deletion of expired items, how they are different. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. It looks like there are some disadvantages of full metadata ejects. So mm -hmm. when should we use that? I'll cover that uh, in the later slide. Yeah, thank you. So then uh, let me explain uh, how the exp uh, collecting expired items is a different between full, uh, meta value only ejection and the full metadata ejection. So in the value only ejection mode, we have our expired pager, which is daemon task, which visit each in-memory hash table regularly and then collect all expired items and then push them into the checkpoint queue for replication and persistence. So because in the value ejection mode, we maintain each key's metadata in memory, even if that item is not resident. So item pager can easily figure out if item is expired or not, right? So then uh, in the full metadata, full metadata ejection mode, it, it is not, now item pager cannot collect all the expired items because now we don't maintain 
we don't cap, we don't maintain ex expression time in memory for non-resident items. So in this case, item pager still can visit each hash table to check the uh, expression time of each resident items. And then uh, there is a we have a database compactor, which is also another daemon task, because Couch, our storage engine is an MBCC with append-only storage model. So it has to, we have to compact the database file to collect the stale blocks from the uh, disk. So the database compactor basically visit each, check each item while doing its compacting, while compacting uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, each item. You look up each uh, item's ha uh, expression time, and then push that, if item is expired, then we push into the checkpoint queue for replication. So then uh, full metadata ejection, there is a, a performance impact, as I mentioned, uh, briefly mentioned before. So more disk I overhead for non-resident items or non-existent uh, non items are required, is required for those APIs. Like uh, for example, CAS, add, delete, and touch operation. Touch operation is basically update expression time, in increment expression time as well, for example. So in this case, uh, if item is not resident in the full ejection mode, then we don't maintain, uh, we don't have the uh, expression time in memory, right? So in this case, we have to fetch the metadata from disk and then uh, inc uh, update the expression time. Okay. Yeah, if, because it, uh, touch is a base crescent that delta that one you want to extend. Yeah. So in this case, uh, basically, if applications Active working set. Active working set is different from application entire uh, data space, right? If application working set cannot fit into the memory, uh, bucket memory quarter, then with value with the full ejection mode, you will get you uh, the application will experience higher higher latencies. And then there is also performance impact on the warm up. So uh, in the value-only ejection mode, as I mentioned before, we have to load all the keys and their metadata into the memory. That's how value-only value ejection works, right? And then we have to now read an access log file to restore the working set data, I mean resident data, resident items before system crash, and then warm-up is completed. In the full ejection mode, full metadata ejection mode, we check we check if we need to load load access log or not. If not, then we just almost is immediately completed, which means we want to start with cold cache. Or then if we need to load access log, then we just load, read the access log file to restore the working set, our resident items before system crash. So full metadata ejection, the full metadata ejection ha uh, has a much faster uh, system warm up time than value on ejection. And then now the question is uh, arise when to use value on ejection and which other use cases we have to use uh, full metadata ejection. So, in this case, uh, basically, let me first explain the value on ejection. The value on ejection is usually recommended for the case where active working set it can be fitting into the bucket memory quarter. And also active working set doesn't change, I mean, it's, or, I mean basically changes fast, relatively fast over the time, like a few hours of uh, cycle. Also uh, light, light to a medium DGM, like a, uh, I would say the resident ratio usually is greater than 20%. Also if the application want to have a very high performance, then uh, value only uh, ejection mode is usually recommended. So let me give some example. You will, you have a web application, which has which has uh, which provides session management. So web session management, web session management system. Each session object has a, usually has an expression time, right? So sixty second to like a five minutes or whatever, right? So for that kinds of application, if you want to manage your all the uh, web session object, then value only ejection mode is usually recommended. Because we can still store, we can still uh, 
uh, manage the all the I, all the session object and their metadata in memory, because their write time is a very short. It's not it's not like a like a, like a, like a two days, seven days, or fourteen days. It's not like that. So These are like a, less than like ten minutes, for example. So items will be collect. Those expired items will be regularly collected and will be removed from the database. Also, web session management system usually uh, want to have high performance. Full metadata rejection is a, almost like opposite use cases. And especially heavy GGM use case. Resident ratio is less than 10%, 5%, even 1%. We already tested with 1% of resident ratio. Uh, it's a huge data set, definitely. So in this case, also application doesn't want to ha doesn't need to have high performance that is comparable to the value ejection mode because that's a trade-off, right? Is uh, you using more memory for fast uh, faster performance, but now you if you don't want to use a uh, much memory, then you just has a limited memory usage, limited memory resource, then you may want to uh, store more data in a disk. So full metadata ejection is uh, usually is uh, recommended for those kinds of scenarios. Uh, okay. So in the full metadata ejection, do you recommend that you use things like SSDs which are faster? Yes, SSDs definitely mitigate the performance uh, regression, obviously. And also another use case is, uh, uh, yeah, I mean also, I mean profile, uh, user profile data, uh, database bucket. So user profile, many of users never log in your system. Only 20% of users are regularly uh, active users, right? So in this case, you don't want to uh, maintain metadata of 80% of your user in the cache, right? So in this case, I re usually recommend the full metadata rejection. Because user profile data is, imagine, it's like a terabyte, several terabyte, eventually hundreds of terabytes of data, right? A default mode is a value on ejection, but you can change to the full metadata ejection, uh, but it requires a bucket to be restarted. Yeah. Per bucket? Yeah, per bucket. It's not, it's not a per server. Yeah, go ahead. When you, when you, get, uh, you have this key that's out there on this, you uh. can go out and get it. And, or even when value is ejected, uh, you can get the value. Do you just get it for that one key, or what do you get the pages of keys or? I mean, uh, I'm not sure if I understand your question, but we basically try to batch read as many as uh, requests as possible. So we don't try we don't we don't try to read one item at a time. Yeah, one item doesn't result in an uh, implicit batch read. So you yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll, yeah, let me, yeah, you have a question? I was going to ask, is that a DB block size parameter? DB block size uh, in the disk level? Yeah. Disk level in the current couch store, we don't have, we have like a high level, uh, the, uh, the B plus three page size. But it's not, we don't support like a uh, low level. We don't have that configuration yet. And then, uh, yeah, I have uh, two minutes, so let me, f yeah. So basically, this is basically our plan to address performance uh, issues. The first one is we want to extend, plan, we plan to extend some of the APIs, and uh, especially we want to provide, for example, asynchronous add or delete or get operation, which means that client issue asynchronous add operation, then the connection won't be blocked. Con we just will figure out, we'll process your add operation, Later on, you can check the status of your ad operation. So that clan connection won't be blocked. They can go move over to the other operations. Because I, as, I mentioned, as I mentioned before, the connection might be blocked if we need to uh, fetch the metadata from disk, right? So ad, asynchronous ad operation doesn't require that uh, block operation. And also, we plan to consider Bloom filter which is a probabilistic data structure that can tell us if given item belong to the, uh, a given set or not. So is a, is a, because, of, because this Bloom filter is a probabilistic data structure, false positive is possible, but false negative is not possible. 
So, uh, but there's a trade-off. If you increase the balloon filter size, then you'll have less, uh, you'll have a smaller uh, first positive ratio. And then, uh, de but definitely this is a, uh, has been used in the NoSQL world to reduce the disk or lookup overhead. And this diagram shows uh, the high level uh, architecture for integrating balloon filter into uh, Couchbase server. So as I mentioned before, item pager is a responsible for uh, ejecting items, right? So whenever item pager ejects some items, it'll update those, uh, it'll add those add those items into the uh, balloon filter. And then, uh, so basically, and then also we have to resize balloon filter because balloon filter will start with a precise, uh, predefined, predefined size, right? And but. As the, as the item page eject more and more items, then uh, false positive ratio will, will increase. So database compactor has to resize to reduce, resize the balloon filter to reduce the false positive. So then when we receive a get operation, we first of all check the hash table. If hash table is saying, oh, I don't have that item, then we have to look up the balloon filter. You just look up the balloon filter before pushing any background fetch, any disk read request into the, uh, into the batch reader, I mean batch reader uh, in the Couchbase server. So that's our current plan. And this Bloom filter most likely will be available in the next release to reduce the uh, disk I or lookup overhead. So today, uh, in this session, I presented a new cache management that we introduced in Couchbase server 3.0 which is a, a full metadata ejection. And obviously, full metadata ejection uh, can allow you to store huge amount of data with, without significant memory overhead. But definitely, it has a performance impact. There is no like a, uh, free lunch. <laughs> so, but our plan to address this performance issue is a, one of them is API, API extension that I mentioned before. And uh, also, Bloom filter integration. And also, the last one is a new storage engine. Uh, we want to uh, enhance our storage layer uh, so that we can have a better I/O throughput. So tomorrow, I'm going to present uh, ForestDB, which is our still in the beta phase, but which is uh, our next generation for, uh, of a storage engine for Couchbase server. So uh, this is end of my uh, presentation. Uh, any questions? Yeah. How, many, how much disk overhead, which means in terms of latency? Yeah, like how, how long does that take? So only a metadata section, right? It depends on the depth of the, depth of the P plus tree. So because uh, as we insert more and more data into the, uh, into the couch base of a cluster, the storage layer, the depth of a B3 will, will increase. So uh, it, it depends on your data size, entire data size. And it depends on your, whether your disk is a hard disk or a spinning disk. So in a hard disk, usually, as you know, the latency of the fetching one page is usually uh, a millisecond, order of, I mean, range of millisecond, right? SSD, usually a microsecond. So, but it, it is affected by a lot of factors, basically, right? Okay, that's subjective, but mm -hmm. if I had a billion keys, mm -hmm. and I only keep one million in memory at a time, mm -hmm. We, we have, uh, uh, currently, the, our storage engine has, uh, uh, as our storage engine rely, rely on uh, OS page cache to cache, to cache those uh, intermediate P plus three node. But in the forest DB, which is our next, gener ne our next generation of storage engine, we have our own buffer cache. We just want to bypass this uh, page cache because OS page cache is a shared resource, shared cache among other uh, the user of our processes, right? So we have a better, we observe the better performance behavior.